Friday, monsters. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of the Murder Murder News podcast, which also serves as a weekly meeting for our very own true crime cult. That's right. We started a cult so we could create a safe space to talk about murder with all of our spooky friends without any of those darker attitudes that sometimes infiltrate true crime circles. Folks who find death funny or serial killers sexy are not welcome. And not to worry, you've landed in the cult with all the baby goats and none of the brainwashing. Grab a flower crown and take a seat around the fire as we dig into another tale of murder. In case you're just finding us now, allow us to introduce ourselves. I'm your favorite true crime pixie, Angelina, and I'm here with the real housewife of true crime herself, Aurora. How's your week going? Oh, it's going. <laughs> it's, it's a doozy. <laughs> it has been a doozy, but I am present. Yeah. Mm, that's that, that's a lot. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> yes. It's a weird world out there. <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Um, we'll, we can get more into the uh, landscape of living in Hungary during a war crisis at the end. <laughs> mm, sounds fair. Yes. <laughs> So just because you tune into our show week after week, we do consider you to be honorary monsters. But if you'd like to officially join the MMN commune, you can do so on Patreon. Just head over to patreon.com slash murder murder news and pledge just a few bucks a month to get unlimited access to our monthly Patreon exclusive episodes. Plus, we'll give you an official title like Deacon or Grandmaster of Goats. And we'll name one of our adorable baby goats in your honor. We just posted a new Patreon exclusive episode this week on the death of colonizer asshole Captain James Cook, who was stabbed to death in Hawaii on Valentine's Day in 1779. If you're a patron, you should go check that out if you haven't already. Let's take a look at some of the true crime stories that have been making headlines this week. There's been an update to the case of missing Indigenous woman, Lisa Marie Young, who we did a whole episode on back in September 2021. Police in Nanaimo, British Columbia, have received new tips and information about Lisa's 2002 disappearance that they consider to be credible and important to their investigation. You may recall that Lisa went missing after accepting a ride from the club to a house party during a night out for a friend's birthday. Lisa's is a case where everyone who knew her knows she was murdered and who was likely involved, but with no arrests made and nobody found, her case is still shrouded in mystery. The investigation into Lisa's disappearance involves hundreds of witnesses and over 15,000 documents. After all these years, Corporal Marcus Muntner, who is leading the investigation, says folks that were too afraid to come forward before are growing more comfortable with sharing the information they have. As many people involved in the case who may have intimidated witnesses out of talking have either moved away or passed away. The reigning Miss Alabama, a 27-year-old woman named Zoe Sozo Bethel, has died as a result of a possible suicide attempt. On February 11th, Miami police responded when Bethel fell from a third-story window in what they're calling a tragic accident. The beauty queen suffered blunt force trauma that put her into a coma. In the early morning hours of February 18th, Miss Bethel was pronounced dead as a result of her injuries. Authorities do not suspect foul play. We'll be right back after a quick commercial break from one of our fellow DarkCast podcasts. If you like weird and strange history, then I have the podcast for you. My name is Brenda, and I'm the host of Horrifying History. Are you into the dark side of history? Horrifying History tells you about the side of history that people don't normally talk about. We talk about the tales of haunted places, infamous true crimes, cursed items, and unsolved mysteries, and then we look into the science and documentation to see where does the truth actually lie. Want to get spooky with us? Get your Horrifying History fix by subscribing to Horrifying History, which you can find on any major podcast provider. And we're back. Now, before we get into our story, we just want to say that while our tone is light in the intro, we do take the topics we're discussing very seriously. We are best buds and we love chatting together every week and turning it into a podcast. We want to share that passion with you and to create a vibe where all of you feel like our best buds too. 
We joke about us friends forming a cult or commune, but that's not to diminish the severity of actual cult activity, which we do occasionally talk about in our weekly stories. We feel it's important to open up and talk about even the darkest aspects of humanity and the downright scary things that come up in the news. But we want to make it clear that our intention is never to sensationalize, and we always try to deliver these stories with respect to all parties involved or affected by the crimes we discuss. We always post our sources in the episode description so you can do some digging on your own if a story we present piques your interest. But you should know that if you ever feel we get it wrong, either in our tone or in the details of the case, we want to hear about it. We are more than happy to make a correction or give an update on a case we've discussed in previous episodes. So feel free to reach out to us at murdermurdernews at gmail.com. Some specific trigger warnings about this episode include abduction, human trafficking, brainwashing, child abuse, and child sexual assault. If any of those are particularly sensitive subjects for you, you may want to skip this one and listen to one of our other episodes instead. 42 years ago this week, an officer just stepping outside of the Ukiah Police Department in California came upon two scared boys and brought them inside. The younger of the two boys quickly identified himself as Timothy White, a five-year-old boy who'd been reported missing by his parents, James and Angela White, 16 days prior, on February 13, 1980. Inside the station, police compared little Timmy against the photo from his missing poster. This boy looked a little different, his hair having been dyed darker by his abductor. Still, they recognized him, and Mr. and Mrs. White came to pick up their son. The other boy was considerably older. He was a teenager and looked a little rough around the edges. Police thought he was likely a delinquent. Initially, the stunned officers believed that maybe this teen was Timmy's abductor, particularly when the kid refused to share his name, how he came across Timmy, or any other details about the situation. But after taking some time to calm down, the older boy was able to explain that he, too, had been abducted. He spent quite a bit of time with his captor seven long years. He was not much older than Timmy when he was picked up at seven years old. He was now 14. He had been hesitant to identify himself or his abductor to the police because he had been brainwashed to believe his captor had obtained legal custody of him. The man had even given the boy a new name, Dennis, which he'd been called for seven years. He couldn't remember too many details about his life before, but he famously uttered, I know my first name is Stephen, which would be the title of a book and later a TV miniseries about his story. I think my last name is Stainer, he continued. Officers knew the name Stephen Stainer, who had been reported missing seven years ago. His parents had never stopped searching for him, and his case got a lot of media attention over the years. Stephen had been the third of five children to parents Delbert and Kay Stainer. He had three sisters, Cynthia, Jody, and Corey, and an older brother, Carrie. When Stephen had gone missing, investigators questioned his parents. They admitted they hadn't specifically spoken to Stephen about things like not accepting rides from people he didn't know or a general stranger danger, but they had just sort of assumed that he knew better. In time, it became clear that Kay and Delbert Stainer didn't exactly talk with their children about much. There wasn't sex talks or safety talks, and there was no emotional conversations of any kind. The parents, Kay especially, had a cold, closed-off demeanor. This all sounds very familiar to me and the way I was raised, but for different reasons. The Stainers were Mormons, and both parents, but especially Kay, had had strict religious upbringings. They were firm believers of out of sight, out of mind, to the point that they believed if you didn't talk about it, whatever it was would go away. The five children were left to their own devices emotionally. Similar to many religious fundamentalist parents, as we talked about in more detail in our episode about the death of Joseph Smith, the Stainers believed in corporal punishment. According to the TV miniseries, Delbert would whip the children with his belt when they acted up. Stephen had allegedly been threatened with one such whipping on the night before he disappeared, which led police to first examine the possibility that his father had accidentally killed him after beating him for arriving home late, though that idea was quickly laid to rest, seeing the family's devastation over the loss of Stevie, as they called him. 
Kay's strict religious father had molested her when she was growing up, and she, of course, would rather not talk about any of that, particularly not to confront her father about the abuse she endured or to warn her children about the types of abuse out in the world that they might encounter or what to do if they did encounter abuse. Kay did allow her elderly father to live on the property with her family in Merced, California. Merced is a small city of about 80,000 people in the San Joaquin Valley, and the large family lived in a small home on Bett Street in a pretty ordinary middle-class neighborhood. But Kay felt she could keep enough of a watchful eye on her dad to prevent him from hurting his grandchildren. And as far as we know, he never did. The children were close with one another, but otherwise everyone pretty much kept to themselves. This cold vibe really intensified when Stephen went missing. Delbert Stainer felt broken at the loss of who he called his favorite son. The family avoided the nightly news because it would make Delbert cry, and crying was so embarrassing. Everyone tried to stay out of each other's hair, and the kids all tried to keep quiet and not upset their grieving parents. The children all reported feeling ignored and emotionally neglected after Stephen's disappearance. Kay's father reportedly told her and Delbert that they should be glad that Stephen was gone because it was one less child to feed and clothe. Yikes. Wow. So here's where it all started. On Monday, December 4th, 1972, seven-year-old Stephen Stainer went to school as usual. After school, he was determined to hurry home since his dad had lectured him about being late and threatened to whip him the night before. Maybe due in part to his determination, Stephen accepted a ride from a stranger, thinking he would get home much faster than if he had walked. I say in part because the stranger who met Stephen on his way home had also spun a story to get the child into the car with him. Irvin Murphy was described by those who knew him as naive, too trusting, and it sounds as though he may have had some intellectual difficulties. He approached Stephen, posing as a missionary, passing out gospel tracts, and asked if the child thought that his mother might have anything that she would want to donate to the church. Stephen later recalled that he had figured his mother probably did have some old clothes and furniture that she would be happy to donate to the church as a religious woman herself. Irvin was out that day with his friend, Kenneth Parnell, who was his co-worker at the Yosemite Lodge in Yosemite National Park. Kenneth had represented himself to his friend as an aspiring minister. Unfortunately, his true identity was that of a manipulative pedophile and convicted sex offender. In 1951, Kenneth Parnell was arrested after using a fake police badge he bought at an army surplus store to impersonate a police officer and lure an eight-year-old boy who he then molested. He was sentenced to four years in prison. He escaped from a prison facility in Norwalk, California, and was recaptured. But I've seen nothing to indicate that he was ever charged with escaping from prison. In an interview, Parnell once explained that he committed the assault on the boy in 1951 because his then-wife was pregnant at the time and, quote, she just got too big for me, I guess, and I needed another outlet, end quote. Yeah. Gross. Parnell had been married and divorced twice and had a daughter with each of his ex-wives. He had also been imprisoned for armed robbery, which was what led his second wife to leave him. Parnell told Murphy that he was lonely and that he had dreamt of being a father and he wanted to acquire a child to give him a good religious upbringing. I guess that was enough to get Irvin on board, so when he met Stephen on his way home from school, he led him to a white Buick with Kenneth Parnell in the driver's seat, and they all left together in the direction of Stephen's home. Stephen remembered in later interviews that he began to feel uneasy when they passed his street and kept on driving. Parnell had told the boy that he would call his parents and ask if they'd mind him going over to his house for a visit. Once he got there, he told Stephen he would ask his parents if he could sleep over. Later, he told him his parents had said it was okay. Stephen didn't really want to stay over. He felt a bit weird about it, but he didn't really have the words to express how he felt at the time. Kenneth Parnell still seemed like an authority of sorts. He was an adult, and he claimed to be in contact with the boy's parents. By the sounds of things, Irvin Murphy didn't stick around to hang out. Alone with the boy that first night, Parnell molested Stephen. 
Obviously, Stephen felt pretty terrible in the morning. He didn't want to stay at the man's house, which was actually his cabin in the woods. The cabin was located only a few hundred feet from Stephen's maternal grandfather's cabin, but neither Kenneth nor Stephen knew it at the time. Stephen took some coaxing to eat his breakfast, and he kept trying to insist that he wanted to go home, but Parnell had an answer for everything. He told Stephen his parents couldn't afford to keep so many kids and that they had granted Parnell full legal custody. At seven years old, it was easy to trick Stephen into believing that he wasn't allowed to leave Parnell's home and that Parnell was in charge of him. Parnell renamed the child Dennis Gregory Parnell, keeping his original middle name and birth date, and enrolled him in school under the identity he created. Thirteen days in, Kenneth Parnell began regularly raping Stephen. Stephen didn't talk about it to anyone. He couldn't say for sure that what this man did to him was wrong, but he knew he didn't like it and he felt ashamed of it. Stephen, now Dennis, diligently went to school and came back home to Parnell, who he now called dad at Parnell's request. Kenneth Parnell would alternate between love bombing the child and abusing him. He gifted him a puppy, a Manchester Terrier called Queenie. The dog had been given to Parnell by his mother, who was allegedly unaware of Stephen slash Dennis's existence. She believed her son was staying in the cabin all along and figured he could use the company of a dog. Parnell would shower the boy in gifts and in turn would beat him mercilessly. Kenneth and Dennis Parnell moved all over California, living in a number of different settings, including in a mobile home in a trailer park and even a converted school bus, usually somewhere pretty isolated. Dennis was always enrolled in school nearby to wherever they were living at the time. Parnell tried to score extra points with his so-called son by allowing him the freedom to do whatever he wanted, to come and go as he pleased, and to have friends over anytime he wanted. The boy was often left home alone while Kenneth was at work. He generally worked odd jobs in the hospitality industry, sometimes in a national park, sometimes in a hotel. Some of his work involved a bit of travel, and Stephen would be left alone for days at a time. Looking back on these days, Stephen later noted that though it may have seemed like he had several opportunities to call for help, he simply didn't know how to call for help. He didn't know his parents' phone number or anyone else's. He couldn't really explain or remember where he had lived before, and Parnell had convinced the boy that his family had moved on without him, at one point even telling him his biological father had died of a heart attack and his mother had moved out of state. As far as he knew, if he called the police, they would just return him to his new dad, Kenneth Parnell. Stephen began smoking and drinking at the age of eight or nine. This was also around the time that Kenneth Parnell began seeing a woman named Barbara Mathias. At first, Barbara alleged that Kenneth paid her $10 an hour to babysit Dennis on several occasions while he was away for work. Barbara had two young children of her own who would play with Stephen slash Dennis. After several months, Barbara and Kenneth moved in together, and Barbara lived with Kenneth and Dennis for about a year. Stephen alleged that during this time, he was raped by Matthias and Parnell together on nine separate occasions. At one point, Parnell tried to get his girlfriend to help him abduct another boy. Barbara targeted a young boy that Stephen knew from the Santa Rosa Boys Club and tried to lure him into Kenneth's car, but her attempt had failed. Matthias would later claim that she had no idea that Stephen had been abducted. She claimed that she was, quote, shocked when she learned about it. I'm going to step into speculation corner for a second and assume that while Barbara Mathias was sharing a home with Kenneth and Stephen slash Dennis. Her own children likely also suffered abuse at the hands of Kenneth Parnell and or their own mother. Yeah, I'll bet. Yeah. Later, Barbara Mathias met Stephen's mother, Kay Stainer, during the trial. Barbara told Kay that if it was any consolation, her son was a good boy. She went on to explain that the boy she knew as Dennis called her mother, just like her own children. This is a really gross move, considering the abuse that she was at least complicit in and allegedly partook in against Stephen, and the attempted kidnapping that she committed. Barbara Mathias has never faced any criminal charges, by the way. By his early teens, Stephen was a heavy drinker. 
His friends would come over and drink and smoke at his place because as they saw it, his dad was chill. One friend, 14-year-old Sean Poorman, was accosted by Parnell to help him procure another boy. As Stephen started going through puberty, Kenneth Parnell's sexual interest in him waned, and I suppose he was having those same feelings again where he, quote, needed another outlet. He told Poorman that he would pay him in cash and weed if he agreed to help, and he did. Kenneth Parnell and Sean Poorman went out cruising in Parnell's Buick and spotted five-year-old Timmy White playing outside his parents' house in Ukiah, California. Poorman tried to convince the little boy to get in the car, but he refused and tried to run towards the front door of his home. Poorman grabbed the kid by the back of his shirt and slammed him into a chain link fence in an attempt to subdue him. When that didn't work, Sean Poorman picked up Timmy and carried him kicking and screaming into Parnell's car. As Parnell paid Poorman and dropped him off, he told him to go away and never talk about the incident to anyone. Sean Poorman was ultimately charged in connection with the kidnapping of Timothy White. Because he was a minor and because his defense invoked the statute of limitations, he received a short sentence at a juvenile work camp. We'll be right back. One of the reasons why I've always been attracted to true crime is that I spend a lot of time processing the worst thing that can happen and kind of planning my escape route if I were to be abducted or find myself on a scary Tinder date. But sometimes I get true crime overload, which leads me to setting up booby traps around my apartment like I'm Kevin McAllister, self-medicating with wine, and struggling with falling asleep. I'm so glad that we talk about therapy so much in this community, and I've learned so much about cognitive behavior therapy from the work I've done and how I can use those tools to calm down when my mind is racing or imagining there could be a serial killer hiding in my closet. We've been using this great app, Nuna, that uses CBT methods in this cool chat function, which helps me get a hold of my thoughts and feel like a friend is helping talk me back to a more reasonable state of mind. You can try Nuna right now to help with your mental well-being and get 25% off when you use our link to sign up. Just go to landing.nuna.ai slash MMN or just click on the link in our show notes for your 25% discount. Let Nuna help convince you that the noise you heard outside your door is probably just your cat up to their usual hijinks. And we're back. At the arrival of Timmy White, Stephen was horrified. When Parnell had asked Stephen to help him abduct another child on repeated occasions, he purposely fudged up the operation each and every time. Unfortunately, that was not enough to prevent his captor from eventually succeeding and bringing home a new, quote, little brother for Dennis. Stephen knew he couldn't stand to see this little kid subjected to the kind of abuse he'd been living through. He felt he didn't have it in him to attempt an escape just to save his own life. As a young teen, he had begun to realize that the things Parnell had been telling him all along were likely not true at all. He started to see Kenneth Parnell for the criminal he was. As an older kid, Stephen was capable of getting around, using the phone, all of the things he wasn't able to carry out when he was first abducted at seven. Still, he didn't feel that his life was worth it. He suffered low self-esteem and a gamut of other issues after sustaining years of trauma. As well, he worried that even if his parents were alive and he could find them, they might not want him back now. He felt like damaged goods. But Timmy was five. He had a whole life of opportunity ahead of him. Parnell had not started sexually assaulting Timmy yet, but Stephen knew that's what was coming. He couldn't let this creep trick another child into believing that his parents didn't want him just to make him stay. Kenneth Parnell was already presenting Timmy as Tommy, his son, and Dennis's brother. On March 1st, 1980, Stephen waited until Parnell left for his night shift as a hotel clerk. He told Timmy that Parnell had been lying to him and that he was going to get him back home to his parents. The two kids hitchhiked into Ukiah, California, and then got out to walk. Stephen wanted to walk Timmy back to his house, but Timmy couldn't remember exactly where that was. 
The boys wandered around until they came upon a police station. And that brings us back around to where we began this story. Timothy White was returned to his parents and the police identified the older boy that was with him as missing child, Stephen Stainer. His parents also came to pick him up, but after seven years, it was not an easy adjustment back to normal family life. Parnell had allowed Stephen to smoke and drink, but Stephen's Mormon parents weren't so keen on that. As his parents put it in an interview, quote, we lost Stevie and we got back Steve. Not to mention the attitudes of the early 80s were not kind to victims of sexual assault. Stephen's parents did not want to hear about it. After Delbert Stainer learned about the abuse his son was subjected to, he couldn't look him in the eye anymore. He wouldn't hug him. Stephen felt like a pariah at home, and at school, it wasn't much better. Other kids made fun of him and called him gay for being a victim of sexual assault. He was teased relentlessly. He was reluctant to testify about any of the abusive acts that Kenneth Parnell carried out on him over the years because neither he nor his family enjoyed being at the center of a media frenzy, and they worried the more detail Stephen shared, the worse it would be for the Stainers. Gosh, like this is just so heartbreaking to hear. And it's like, he's a hero in all of this. Like he saved this kid. He's and, a total hero. Ugh, like poor Stephen. Yeah. And he comes back and he doesn't get to celebrate and he doesn't get to feel relief. It's just like continued trauma. Right. So by daybreak on March 2nd, 1980, Kenneth Parnell had been arrested. He was tried for the kidnappings of both Stephen Stainer and Timothy White in 1981 but not for sexual assault. The reason for this is most of the assaults took place outside the jurisdiction in which Parnell was being processed and the statute of limitations had been exceeded. He was sentenced to seven years in prison, but got out in five. Elvin Murphy, Parnell's accomplice, admitted to assisting him in multiple attempted abductions as well as the abduction of Stephen Stainer. He was sentenced to five years in jail, but was paroled after two. Stephen Stainer never really saw justice in his case, but his case did prompt California lawmakers to allow consecutive sentences in similar abduction cases. Stephen Stainer spiraled. He was free, life was normal, but he couldn't shake the trauma he had endured. It probably didn't help that his parents forbade him from seeking therapy after his return. Stephen turned into a bit of a punk and a bit of a thrill seeker. He continued to drink heavily. He dropped out of school. His father, Delbert, ultimately kicked him out of the family home. A writer named Mike Eccles wrote the book about Stephen's story titled, I Know My First Name is Stephen, which was adapted into a TV miniseries in 1989. Some critiqued the book as a little too sensational and didn't appreciate the graphic descriptions of child sexual assault. Some lauded his work as groundbreaking. Apart from the book about Stephen, Eccles also wrote a book about a Pentecostal preacher pedophile named Brother Tony Leva, and he carried out acts of vigilante justice against pedophiles. He would dox people, he would set up his own stings, and he set up a website trying to identify previously unidentified victims of child pornography. He also started a nonprofit organization called better a millstone that was set up to take down pedophiles and child pornographers. The problem is Eccles had a bit of a reputation for being a bit over the top and going a bit too far. He was in cahoots with some pretty out there conspiracy theorists, Pizzagate style pedophile ring conspiracies. He carried out his own infiltration of NAMVLA, the North American Man Boy Love Association, a pro pedophile group. He was certainly controversial, but I can't attest to whether he personally did more harm or good in regards to his fight against pedophilia. Mike Eccles also had his own troubles with the law. He didn't handle confrontation well, and he had a bit of a habit of publicly exposing himself when he didn't get his way. Once in a ticket dispute on a bus, Eccles dropped his drawers in front of the bus driver and passengers and was arrested and escorted off the bus. In 2003, Mike Eccles died in custody in the Monterey County Jail in California of a pulmonary embolism. He was in jail for failing to appear in court after being charged with indecent exposure, among other crimes. 
1985, Stephen married 17-year-old Jody Edmonston. Stephen got a job at a pizza shop. The couple had two children, a daughter named Ashley and a son named Stephen Jr. Stainer tried his best to move on with his life and to create his own positive resolution to his harrowing story. He began to work with child abduction groups and counsel children about personal safety. He also joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yes, he had grown up Mormon, but understandably, he had lost his faith during his ordeal and didn't find God again until adulthood. On September 16, 1989, Stephen Stainer was riding his motorcycle without a helmet when he got into an accident and sustained fatal head injuries. I've read a couple of different accounts of his death. Some say he was killed in a hit and run, and the driver of the other vehicle was later identified by witnesses. Some say the other car stalled in front of Stephen, and he rear-ended it and went flying from his motorcycle. In any event, the driver of the other vehicle was not charged in Stephen's death. Stephen was 23 years old at the time of his death. 500 people attended the funeral for Stephen Stainer, and Timothy White served as a pallbearer. Lord knows what Kenneth Parnell was doing between 1986 and 2003, but in 2003, he was a 71-year-old man. He had suffered a stroke. He had diabetes and emphysema. He lived in a tiny, cluttered apartment in Berkeley, California, and required round-the-clock care from a live-in caregiver. Despite the fact that Kenneth Parnell was so sick and so old that he wasn't capable of taking care of himself independently, he decided he needed a little more excitement in his life. Parnell propositioned Diane Stevens, his caregiver, to go out and get him a boy. Where he had found so many willing accomplices back in the 70s, the tides had turned on Kenneth Parnell. Dan was aware of his previous convictions, and though she told Kenneth that, yes, she would help him, she then directly went to the police and began to work with them to set up a sting operation. High five, Diane. Yeah. (laughs) Stevens alleged that Parnell specifically requested a boy with a, quote, clean rectum, which indicated his intention to sexually assault a child. He paid her $100 to acquire a false birth certificate and agreed to bring $400 in cash when he went with her to purchase the boy. Kenneth Parnell was apprehended while, as prosecutor Tim Wellman put it, he was looking for a last hurrah. After largely getting away with multiple despicable acts over the course of his life, creating a ripple effect that ruined a number of people's lives in the process. During Parnell's trial in 2004, Timothy White was summoned to testify. He was 29 years old at the time. Sean Poorman was also summoned to testify, and he was shocked to see little Timmy all grown up. White had forgiven Poorman and then enjoyed catching up and shared a hug when they met the day of the trial. Poorman was 38 at the time. Kenneth Parnell was tried on charges of human trafficking and attempting to kidnap a child. Thanks to California's three strikes law, Parnell was sentenced to 25 years to life. He remained incarcerated until his death in 2008 at the California Medical Facility in Vacaville. He died of natural causes after having been in hospice care for some time. Timothy White grew up to be a deputy with the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. He was awarded the position in 2005, just one year after Parnell's final trial. Like Stephen, He gave talks to children about his experience and the dangers of kidnapping. He had a wife named Dina and two children, a daughter named Hannah and a son named Lucas. Timothy White died on April 1st, 2010, also of a pulmonary embolism. In August of 2010, a statue was erected in Applegate Park in Merced, California, dedicated to the memory of Stephen Stainer and Timothy White. A similar statue was erected by residents of Ukiah, depicting Stainer and White escaping hand in hand. It's difficult to tell what became of the wives and children of Stephen Stainer and Timothy White, as well as Stephen's sisters or parents. Understandably, the families like their privacy after years in the spotlight. Stephen's older brother, Carrie Stainer, actually grew up to be a serial killer. But that's a story for another day. Ooh, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, that story had everything, and we could only touch on so much in one episode, but it just, like, really shows how um, 
how the effects really spread out and and affect so many people when um, right. someone is abused or abducted um, or, you know, when there's predators out there. So sad. But like, just amazing that Stephen, um, you know, like I, I can understand like being a child and, you know, in case family life maybe wasn't so great to begin with. And then having mm. somebody like trick you into thinking your parents don't want you, like you're here now and feel like you can't escape, but yeah. Then like finally putting it together when uh, kind of kidnapped another boy and being like, no, I'm not letting this happen to him too. It's just yeah. so brave. So amazing. Yeah. I, I just like really can't imagine like feeling so just like um, defeated. And he felt yeah. like, you know, it wasn't worth saving his own life, that he was just uh, resigned to um, living out the rest of his days with Parnell. But right. uh, but he he had to rescue this little boy. It's just so honorable. Amazing. And it's really yeah. sad that he didn't uh, really get much of his life back when he uh, no, was No, he died free. so young. Yeah. yeah. So this week, um, I didn't watch anything murdery per se, but I had plenty of death and apocalyptic storylines. <laughs> My first recommendation is a movie called How It Ends. Um, have you heard of that? I haven't. I saw it on your okay. Facebook, though. Mm. I did look it up. So <laughs> maybe with like a years-long global pandemic and the potential start of World War III, you'd rather watch something more removed. Or maybe you're like me and just can't get enough of the end of the world right now. <laughs> I just can't stop watching things like this. I don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> enter How It Ends. Um, I need to specify that there are at least two films titled How It Ends. And after I recommended um, the movie on my Facebook, my friend went to check it out and she watched the wrong movie. <laughs> oh, no. So the one she saw was more of an action thriller. That one I can't really speak about. I didn't watch it. But this movie I'm talking about came out in 2021 and it's directed by and stars Zoe Lister-Jones, who I wasn't particularly familiar with, though I've definitely seen her in things. I guess she was in New Girl and Bored to Death, and she's actually one of Mr. Big's accusers because he oh. sexually harassed her on the set of Law & Order. So that's oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah. So the plot of the movie is it's the last day on Earth. A big comet is coming to wipe out the whole planet. It's on the news. Everybody knows about it. They've seen it coming. And today is the day it will hit. So Zoe's character, Liza, is invited to an end-of-the-world party. And while she mulls over whether or not she wants to go, she embarks on a bit of a quest to visit everybody that she shares unresolved feelings with um, and talk it out, you know? So she this includes her, her parents, some exes, a close friend she had a falling out with. She's mm -hmm. going along and visiting sort of each person systematically. Um, at every turn, it's a cool new comedian or a veteran actor. So... Uh, tons of people are in this movie. Nick Kroll is in it, Whitney Cummings, Fred Armisen, Helen Hunt, Polly Shore, oh, nice. singer Sharon Van Etten, who I love. It's very cool um, ensemble cast. And uh, the movie is one part philosophical journey like Waking Life and one part quirky on the nose indie flick. And the whole time, Liza's out there walking around with some embodied version of her younger self, who she also has to reckon with. Just loved it. Highly recommend. Right. Um, the other thing I started watching is a horror series called Black Summer. Have you heard of that one? Mm -mm. So I never did either. I just clicked on a random thing. Nice. Um, the synopsis on Netflix didn't say anything about the plot. It just said that the series gained a following after rave reviews from Stephen King and others. So I had no idea what I was getting into. <laughs> Um, which is probably a good thing because I wouldn't have watched it. <laughs> the show <laughs> is um, apparently based in the same universe as another series I hadn't seen called Z Nation. So, yeah, it's zombies. I'm so over zombies. Yeah, <laughs> and that's why I would have skipped this one if I had known. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I didn't. So I jumped into the series having no idea what the big disaster was. And the characters didn't know either. So it was fun to sort of watch that unfold as they did. Um, this actually is more of a horror drama, and it doesn't have a lot of the typical zombie tropes, so I'm actually enjoying it. It's There's nothing, um, nice. none of the regular zombie stuff to turn me off. It's a, it's, a, it's a cool vibe. I like it. Netflix called it sparse, which is an interesting way to describe horror, and I think mm -hmm. that gives you a bit of an idea about the overall vibe. So if you're right. feeling like watching a, a, some sparse, apocalyptic, <laughs> scary stuff, there it is. Yeah. What about you? Um, What'd you watch? I mean, my whole life is a horror movie right now. So, yeah. it's, it's been <laughs> so you're little, trying not to watch yeah. extra horror movies, maybe? I, I, I have enough. I've been having yeah. to just watch like kind of mind clearing nonsense, trying 
to like get Avoid to a happy the news. place. Yeah. 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 I've uh, been very guilty this week of finding myself in an anxiety spiral after uh, just like seeing so many like posts about not like negativity, like it's interesting being mm-hmm. in Budapest right now and um, having so many refugees flee here. And fortunately, Hungary has opened its uh, borders to refugees, which is mm-hmm. amazing um, mm-hmm. and just fantastic to see so many people jumping in to help. But it's like seeing being in all these like Budapest groups because you know, I'm just like in them anyways, because I live here, like how people giving advice on where to find peanut butter. Like, it's like, you see that post mm. six times a day. And now it's just all like, <laughs> this family needs help. This family needs help. This family needs help. Like we need these supplies here immediately. Wow. And it's like nice being able to feel like you can like do something. Cause sometimes when these things happen, yeah. I feel like I'm too far away. It's, it's like, I guess yeah. I'll send money. Like, I don't really know what to do. Right. Like, please tell yeah. me something to do. I want to help. And uh, uh-huh. seeing like so many people willing to help is great. And I'm right by the big train station in Budapest where everybody is arriving here. So wow. I've been able to go over there and like bring supplies and stuff. And um, like That's one so great. one thing that's like interesting to see unfold, you know, like I just like said how proud I am of like Hungary and everybody for like being so helpful. But like one bad thing that's happening right now, um, which is maybe something you all could look into, like these are some organizations that might be able to be helpful, is that there are a lot of people from Ghana living in Ukraine and uh, they okay. go to school there and there's just a big community mm-hmm. there. So they are currently fleeing and trying to decide how to get home. Um, and unfortunately, you know, every country has racism, but like being in Eastern Europe where it's a very white, white area, um, mm-hmm. police and soldiers have been kicking them off of trains and start and trying to prevent them from leaving. Um, and then unfortunately, like I'm seeing in posts like here, people are like, I want to help house Ukrainians. And people will be like, great, we have some students from Ghana. And they're like, no, I said oh Ukrainians. And it's like, <laughs> like, go F yourselves. Like, it's yeah. just, it's such a nightmare to see that happening. So um, we, I believe, are going to have two students from Ghana staying with us this week. And, Aww, and there's got to be some organizations that like, mm-hmm. y'all like, look it up. I haven't researched it yet. Like hopefully helping them specifically. Um, yeah. would be great. And another thing I know, like it's when y'all are probably a bit further away than we, than I am right now. Um, I also have a friend, a good friend of mine from Ukraine that has lived in the U S for years. He has family in Ukraine still. And, uh, he was saying that like, they're trying to help his family get to the U S and the U S is not giving visas right now, uh, to Ukrainians. Wow. And that's really disappointing to hear. So maybe that's something yeah. you could call your senators or whatever, and mm-hmm. demand that they start letting refugees into the U S so they're not breaking up families. Um, yeah. I feel like we could be doing more to help on that front. And of course, there's always great organizations to donate to if you are, um, Able, which maybe we'll try to link to some of those in show notes. I yeah. keep seeing posts yeah, about the, the ones that are supposedly very good here. So I'll try to repost some of those as well. Yeah. Another cool thing I've been seeing is um, either Ukrainian people um, creating some cool sort of t-shirts and stickers and things like yeah. that to um, help raise money and spread awareness uh, of the situation, as well as non-Ukrainian people makers creating things um, for the cause and donating the proceeds. Right. So that's pretty cool as well. Uh, One of the nice things I've seen a lot about is, um, have you seen that old lady that told the Russian soldiers to put sunflower seeds in their pockets so that uh, when they fell, at least flowers would grow? which is like a really cute message. And like a lot of people have been making uh, things out of that, which, uh, which is nice. It's a, it's a cool, um, just sort of like metaphor, I guess. That's great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's really hard to watch from, from afar and feel totally powerless. And it's really interesting to contemplate the, um, the racist elements like you were talking yeah. about, because I saw on the news um, one day they were talking about um, refugees and how a lot of nearby countries are um, willingly accepting refugees, um, which is great. But uh, someone had asked this uh, this newscaster, like, what's the difference? Like, why, you know, when we had the, the Syrian crisis, um, people weren't really ready to accept refugees, and now they're just right into it, and what's the difference? Right. And she kind of answered um, basically with, like, well, frankly, these are white people. <laughs> so that's really, right. um, you know, like, obviously help 
everyone. These people are all in a tragedy and they could all use your help, but don't overlook people just because maybe they don't look like you or sound like you. Like, yeah, obviously a lot of people near the Ukraine know Ukrainian people and they seem similar to them and they can relate and they want to help them. But, you know, everybody that's trapped in this crisis needs, needs some help and needs some attention. So. Yeah. Agreed. And like another thing to keep in mind, just like seeing kind of problematic attitudes pop up is this sort of like hate towards Russians and just Mm -hmm. keeping in mind that it's, it's a huge country and run by a dictator, but run by a dictator. And like yeah. these people have had their power stripped away for so long. Like mm-hmm. it's just, please don't find yourself in that like blame cycle. Like we can definitely no. blame Putin. He's garbage, like whatever, yeah. like, but. But the residents, even if they support the war, yeah. um, they've probably been brainwashed by Putin. If they don't yeah. support the war, they're not really free they're to risking speak their up. lives to not support yeah. the war right now too. And yeah. I keep seeing so much information about Russian protesters and like they Being really arrested. Yeah. Yes. They're really risking their lives right now to stand yeah. up against it. So just please be kind right now. Like it's just, it's a tough time. Mm-hmm. Oh, you know, I did watch one thing. Oh, what'd you watch? I can't believe I forgot this. Um, I've been, uh, uh, I was telling Angelina before this, that I've been self-medicating with alcohol over the weekend and was just oh, yeah. a complete disaster. And I'm now <laughs> reining it in. I just like hit my breaking <laughs> point. And then I was like, yeah. I got back from Croatia and like things were just so stressful here. And it just didn't feel like there was you anything I could do it. to help. And it was very mm-hmm. doomy and gloomy. So I overdid it and was very hungover mm-hmm. on Sunday and did not leave my couch. And I watched the new Scream movie. Oh, <laughs> how was it? You know, I liked it. And I've heard so many yeah. bad things about it. Like I've heard mm. like such negativity and that it's boring or it's this or whatever. But like, I thought it was, you know, it's, it's not going to be as groundbreaking as the original, obviously, but you get this reunion kind of feel where they're like bringing back oh, like nice. Dewey and they're bringing back Gail and they're bringing back Sydney. but then there's like new mm-hmm. main characters and they're all kind of like interconnected and um, so it's really a callback for like yeah. 80s and 90s kids that watched it when they were younger. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Cool. And like, you know, it's funny because I was like watching it with my friend Fanny and I could like say that like I guessed who it was going to be from the beginning, but I also guessed it was going to be every single person. <laughs> it's like, I guess some point she called me out. She's like, you have to stop it. You've named everyone now. Like you thought it was Sydney at one point. And then you're like, like I was right. <laughs> See, I was right. I and guessed then, it. And then I yelled that in the end. I was like, I knew it. And she's like, you 100% did not. <laughs> oh, that's but, um, great. She was kind of like, she loves horror movies as well and is quite like picky about them. And um, like, I'm a little bit easier to please than she is, but she even oh, yeah. like enjoyed it. Like we both like found it to be very watchable and like had some jump scares and whatever. I so think that's I a good it. review. From what I've heard, Fanny likes to turn off a lot of movies if they're not exciting within the first like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. On Christmas Eve, I'm like text or something. Like I'm texting Angelina. I think it was on Christmas Day. And I'm like, we want to watch like only Christmas horror movies. What should we watch? And Angelina gave us a list of 10. And like, I managed to find them in Hungary, which is not easy. And like, Fanny would be like, no, I don't like this. No, this is boring. Nope, 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 nope. And like, through all of them. (laughs) Yeah. And finally, I got her to watch Ready or Not, which is not a Christmas Mm. movie, but the wedding thing kind of felt celebratory, which she loved. But like, yeah, she's like, there was 10 that you recommended that I've heard highly recommend by others that were just not for her. So she's nope, quite nope, picky. Nope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So rave review. I guess yes. we should all watch Scream. <laughs> yeah. Let us know what y'all think. I, I for one, enjoyed it. Well, I guess that's enough murder for one week. If you need just a smidge more murder, you can always find us on the OG murdermurder.news for the latest breaking true crime news all week long. You can find us on Instagram at Murder Murder News. You can find us on Twitter at Murder News. Mm. And uh, this past week, we posted a meme about uh, something about like being, everybody likes weirdos until you're sitting next to your cat wearing matching pajamas on your couch talking to them about true crime or something <laughs> along those lines. And so like our caption was tag your best friend to watch true crime with or better yet, if that happens to be your cat, tag them. And we got flooded mm-hmm. with pictures on Twitter of people and their crime solving cats. So, so that Which really we can made never complain week. about. Yes, please send <laughs> All us the cats. your crime solving cats like yeah. anywhere. Like you don't even have to tag it on that post, but um, it really made my week. <laughs> just send us cats at any random occasion. We just love 
Especially if your cats love true crime. We're, exactly. we're into them. <laughs> or if they are little criminals. <laughs> and you can also find us on TikTok at Murder Murder News, where this past week we explored the case of the Atlanta child murders and whether Wayne Williams was really responsible for all the murders. We definitely want to hear your thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. You can also find us on Facebook by searching for Murder Murder News. And when you search for Murder Murder News on Facebook, you'll also see our group pop up. You'll want to hit that join button to stay in the loop about any upcoming events we may have and to join our virtual book club. We just had our first book club meeting of 2022 this past Sunday, and now we're on to our second book, which is a book called The Good House by, and I hope I say this correctly, um, Tanana Reeve Du? Something like this. Sorry if I butchered so it. So sorry, we forgot um, to look that up. But um, yeah. the book is supposed to be amazing. So we'll yeah, know we're what really looking forward how to how it's pronounced by next week, we promise. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so this is time for a little bit of spooky fiction. We're going to meet on Zoom on Sunday, March 27th. And we definitely want to see you there. So get reading. Don't forget to leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts if you're enjoying the show. And don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform to make sure you never miss an episode. Have a great week. Bye, friends. Bye.